for Mars Arts Photography. I am a specialist, music photographer and a bit of nature photography on the side. I am the resident photographer for Ferrycroft House for which I am filming right now. We are currently in COVID-19 lockdown and I am in complete isolation. You will never see another person in this building at the moment. I am solely here to provide an information video for Walden Creative on the beginning of your endeavours as a photographer. It will be basic and it'll be very short. Please bear with me. So, the basics we need to uh, address, first of all, is your gear. This is Bertha. This is the kit I use for professional live music photography. It's very expensive and as a beginner, I suggest you do not go down the route to using this first. Um, when I first started out, all I used to use was a point and click camera. Um, it's the best, perfect way of getting your art form together. When I was a youngster, when I was starting, we didn't have these. These are probably the most ideal way of getting entry level photographs. Don't worry about live music photographers first of all. What you need to do is see something around the house and practice. It sounds very basic, family, friends, flowers, your dog, anything that catches your eye. One of the most misled conceptions I personally find with photography is people want to talk about the kit. People with money, they go straight in with this. I call them all kit, no clue. What you really need to do is address the most important fact and tool you can have as a photographer. Isn't this, isn't this, and people say, the eye. No, it's here. It's your imagination, your artistic streak, what you envisage in your head, and what you can create. That is the most important tool you will ever need. Forget everybody telling you about the most expensive cameras. Forget people talking about how, what kit they've got. Have you got a Canon? Have you got a Sony? Have you got a Nikon? Get that in order first. That is my first lesson to you. for Mars Arts Photography. I am a specialist music photographer and a bit of nature photography on the side. I am the resident photographer for Ferrycroft House for which I am filming right now. Here's another little trick I've picked up over the years. People quite often say to me, how can you hold a camera without a shaking? Whenever I'm holding a camera, everything comes blurry. Um, you can, of course, you can use tripods um, in my in my fields, using tripods are not particularly suitable. I have to think on my feet, I have to shoot very, very quickly. It's okay if, you put, if you're uh, photographing flowers or, or anything stationary, then by all means use a tripod. But here's a little trick I picked up. It's very, very, very simple. All I say to people when they say to me about wobbly photographs is lock your elbows. So all I would do is hold it like that and look your arms to your side and you'll get a nice stationary image regardless if it's a phone or a large camera like this. Of course most modern cameras have auto stabilizers, mobile phones and very basic cameras done. It's a very very simple trick, try it, it really works. So simple, look.
Good afternoon. My name is Martin. I'm a photographer for Mars Arts Photography. I am a specialist music photographer and a bit of nature photography on the side. I am the resident photographer for Ferrycroft House, from which I am filming right now. Right, this leads me to framing. When you're taking photographs, obviously the most key important thing is what it looks like. Now, there are many, many technical schools of thought on how you frame a photograph. It's too in-depth for me. This is a beginner's lesson to inspire young photographers to get out and just practice. And that's all I would suggest you do. Or you can look at a photograph and you know if it's a good composition or it's not. If you're a photographer, be it a beginner or an experienced photographer, you know what a photograph should look like. You shouldn't really be lectured to. Um, the one thing I would say is, don't be afraid to crop a photograph in the hindsight. Um, take as many photographs as you can and practice, practice and practice and practice. That is probably the most important thing of learning your chops of a framing photograph. There's the rule of the third, there's parallel lines. Don't crop people's heads out, don't crop limbs out. Try to keep headstocks in if you're photographing guitars. Even then, there are exceptions to the rule. You'll know the best feedback you can get is from your family members. I wouldn't go wading in posting photographs to professionals. You'll find that a few people will be unduly negative and knock your confidence. I wouldn't do that. I suggest you learn your tricks by practicing and in your heart knowing what is right and what you like. for Mars Arts Photography. I am a specialist music photographer and a bit of nature photography on the side. I am the resident photographer for Ferrycroft House from which I am filming right now. So it brings me to lighting. Now lighting is a bit of a tricky one for me because as a professional music photographer I have been banned from using a flash for industrial reasons and so therefore I am so uncomfortable with the images with flashes in them then I will not use a flash under any circumstances whatsoever. Yet, you know, flash photography and lighting and bulbs and setup are all part of the art form. They are, once again, something you should experiment with. Shadowing can be your enemy, and shadowing can be a great friend as a photographer. You know, sometimes a shadow coming across a photo will absolutely wreck it. Other times, if it's halfway across a face or something like that, in the proper artistic situation, it is brilliant. Once again, don't forget to experiment. Try not to shoot directly into sunlight, but then again, once, we have, once again, sun shooting out behind a object can be a nice little uh, photo. It depends, once again, on your right. You'll pick these things up, learn, experiment, try to work in a nice, naturally lit environment. Um, I Personally, don't like using artificial lights. Nothing wrong with them, I'm using them right now. But live concert photography, where I'm most comfortable, I shoot at very high speeds and I borrow the light from the light show. And that is what makes my job quite difficult. Um, it's an art form. So don't get me wrong, it's something you have to work at. Practice, practice, and practice. Good afternoon. My name is Martin. I'm a photographer for Mars Arts Photography. I am a specialist music photographer and a bit of nature photography on the side. I am the resident photographer for Ferrycroft House, from which I am filming right now. Editing. Now there are a number of thoughts when it comes to editing. Professional wedding photographers, 
landscape photographers and many, many, many professional photographers will spend hours and hours and hours on Photoshop per photo. And quite rightly so, certain forms of photography leads to this situation. But don't fear, you do not have to go down that route if you don't want to. I've been working in the industry 10 years, I don't own Photoshop. I don't particularly worry about using Photoshop. I personally think, and this is only personal and just as a guide, I believe that if a photo isn't there in the first place, then it's no use to me. I'm not afraid to crop an image and in music life, music photography situations, then maybe darken it and just light the light up. But you can do that on very basic art packages. You don't need Photoshop. Don't let me get it wrong. If you want to use Photoshop, there is absolutely nothing wrong with using Photoshop. It's all to do with your own creative heart. What you see in your head, how you want that image. Don't let anybody have a go at you for manipulating the image. It's your art. It's up to you. You do what you want. Don't worry about what negative people say. Listen to positive people. Listen to other academics and artists. Do not follow somebody else's vision. You'll know, you'll get good, I believe it. It's all to do with, I'm afraid to say it again, trial and error and practice. By all means, spend hours editing photographs. I do, pure and simply, because I take thousands in one night. It is a very, very important part of photography. The actual shooting of photographs may take me three hours in a night and then take me the entire day the next day without me actually photoshopping anything. That is a fact of photography, especially digital photography. Want to take better photos? Of course you do. Well, have a listen to this fellow, Martin Porter's back exploring one of his masterpieces in Behind the Lens. Good afternoon, my name's Martin from Arts House Photography here for Lockdown TV at Ferrycroft House. I've got five or six photographs that I'm going to dissect for you to show you how to capture live photography and a few little tips all in between. Now I'm going to move on to the first photograph which is taken in the first venue on the tour of Europe in Belgium of the guitarist or leader Dan Alex. It was a very very hard shoot to do. It was a absolutely packed venue. There was no photo pit, the crowd was manic and rather Mary. Concert photographers are not allowed to use a flash and generally they only get three songs. The guitar is very nicely in focus. It's bright red, it draws your attention. The photo has a symmetry of diag diagonal lines of the guitar body and neck from corner to corner. Um, it's a very nice position. Image two is Tim on bass for a leader down. Um, it's a black and white image taken in Germany on the main concert of the tour. Black and white is a great way of saving a good photo that was perhaps let down by the lighting at the venue or the concert. Strobing lights and moving lights are a necessity and also a godsend for a photographer, but it could also bleach out a photograph or make, it, make the contrast wrong. So you can just go into any editing suite, cheap editing suites, doesn't have to be Photoshop, and you just flick the photo over from colour to black and white and you'll be surprised. What looked like an unusable photograph could be one of the best shots in the whole set. The concentration on his face is brilliant, there's clear logos, and the dry ice blur in the black drop draws the focus onto Tim. So this next photograph is of Matt, the lead singer. You can see the spotlight diagonally from one corner to another corner. Nice bit of um, third and thirds there. The microphone is very important in this shot. It does not obscure his mouth. P 
PR guys have told me that magazines will not publish photographs if the, the mouth of the lead singer is obscured by the microphone. And just to the right, once again, the logo is clear, bright and coloured. It's unmissable, yet not central to the focus. A very good concert photograph or an album sleeve will sell thousands of records. Now this one is a nice one. It shows a lot of motion and a lot of energy. You can see what he's feeling with that note he hits. The concert goes heads slightly blurred in the foreground give the presence that they're there. It shows that the band are playing in front of a crowd while not obscuring the photograph. And a nice, nice burst of light directly behind Tim's head shining through the haze makes it have a, a, a draw of attention. But the most important part of that photograph is the movement. You can see it's there and there in a moment. The band were really pleased with a number of the photographs that come off this mobile and they were used all over their social media and I dare say I'm pretty sure that Tim has told me they will be making the album sleeve as well. The first one you'll see is a lovely bit of interplay between Dan on drums and Matt the lead singer. They were mucking about and they were having fun. The other one was um, from the band from behind, standing just in front of the drum riser on stage and there's Tim in the full court and all you can see going off into the background are the crowd. Bands love that. The other one is the same photograph from the back of the room over the crowd's head with a lovely light display. Um, the leader of down logo right across the background. You can see it's leader of down and you can see thousands of people. It's Martin from Arts Arts Photography, once again at Ferrycroft House for Lockdown TV. Um, this week's lesson is going to be how to shoot the moon. And I'm not talking about your brother's backside, I'm talking about the big ball in the sky. Um, so, first things first, you will not get away with using a mobile phone, unfortunately, photographing the moon. Um, there's not one camera on the market that the preset or a autofocus will manage to uh, meter the moon. So you will have to use a DSLR or a mirrorless. Um, ideally, the bigger the lens, the better. You don't need such a big lens as this, but the bigger, the better. So if you can get hold of one of these, if your dad's got one or your mum's got one, and you can borrow it and they trust you, then the bigger, the better. You can zoom right in. Um, always, if you can, capture the moon at its highest during the night and try to capture it on perfect days um, without clouds. You can photograph with clouds, but ideally on perfect weather. Um, a tripod is always essential if you're out and about with your camera and you didn't have the intention of capturing the moon in a photograph and you don't have a tripod, you can, and I have in the past, use the locked elbows technique I told you in the first lesson. So you put your arms together like that and you hold. And you keep yourself steady. If there's a wall or a, a garden table or a bench or anything like that, you can use it to stabilize yourself if you haven't got a tripod. Now you've moved that around like that. So you've got your manual. Now the next thing you need to do is set your ISO. Um, your ISO ideally for moon photography needs to be low. I'd say around about 100. The lower, the less noise. So definitely I would always use it on 100. So we go down here. Bang, 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 bang. bang. Set. So the ISO is next set for 100. The next, choose your aperture. Between F 13 well to be honest with you it's on there 13 I'd go between f11 and 16 um, it depends on your lens and your lighting conditions um, take a number of shots until you find a sweet spot until you find what comes out right so if I believe that so that's your dial there so get your aperture 
I'd say, let's, let's call it 13, start at 13, you can either dial it back or go 16 until you've got it so that you want it. Um, shutter speed should ideally between between 160 and 125, I'd say, we'll start at 160. So that is the shutter speed I would start at, the perfect setting for taking moon photography photos. So always set your aperture on f11 and then your shutter speed and your ISO should always replicate each other. So f11 and if the ISO is 100, the speed's 100. And then also, so going up gradients, if that doesn't come out clear, f11 again, ISO 200 and then shutter speed. 200 so you go up in a gradual that is called a lunar or loony 11 so it's easy for you to remember so once you get home and you're looking at it on your editing suite um, it's very simple a simple auto white balance should be okay and you shouldn't need to change any settings if you do just look at the contrast and the clarity slides that's all you really need to do you, you might get away with um, having a quick look at the sharpness if you can see the craters and the dents in the moon but generally just the contrast and the clarity and maybe black and white black and white photos of the moon are very cool um, it's worth having a look at that so I hope you enjoyed that module on shooting the moon on the next episode I will be touching on nature photography on how to get perfect photos of wildlife and flowers now here's Martin Porter, who, having shot almost everyone in town, has put his sights on the local bird population. Good afternoon, it's Martin from Mark Sites Photography. Um, today's lesson will involve nature photography and a few tips and nice little fun facts about natural history and the role my knowledge of natural history had in taking these photographs. I am a firm believer that if you know and love your subject matter, it shows in your photographs. And also, if you do know animal behavior, you've got a little idea of what that animal is going to do and you can be ready for it. First up, you don't have to go to Africa and photograph the big six. There are plenty of native animals in the UK. The European Robin is a very good subject for photography to start with. They are very obliging to photograph. Um, they have a lovely orange breast and they have a very friendly matter. Robins in history followed wild boars around while they rooted for roots and the birds learnt to find food this manner. So therefore, when humans arrived in the UK and in Europe, they followed the human beings around. That's why robins are very, very friendly and that's why they're very easy to photograph. Another thing with robins that makes them very easy to photograph is they are incredibly aggressive to other birds. So they will be so busy singing, fighting, and going about their business, you can approach a robin within metres. They are so easy. You'll find one in your garden, on your bird table, and they sing very loudly. You will see them. Now, the photo I'm going to show you is of a robin only three metres away. Um, I was actually photographing baboons in Peyton Zoo, funnily enough, and this little fellow was singing behind me, three metres away, not far, no further than the camera is from me now. And I just turned around and I rattled this photo off. Now you'll see it singing its heart out. Its beak's really wide open now. So easy to photograph. Beginner's tip. Start with garden birds. So photo two is grey squirrel. They are very easy targets for photographers. Food and friendliness makes them very, very brave. Now this photo also contains a very good lesson. Respect the animal and its space. Never go near, never frighten, never pick up, never touch them or pose with them. Respect them. 
Now, unfortunately in this photo, I did not practice what I preached. You will see this is a baby squirrel. It's tiny, it's smaller than the palm of my hand, but I didn't take no notice. I went nearer and nearer and nearer. You'll see its tail over the top of its head. Now, while it was doing this and flicking its tail, it was making itself look very big and it was chattering its teeth. It made for a good photograph, apart from a little bit of grass that goes across. But all animals warn you and they will warn you two, three times. Now, I was so busy doing my photography, I ignored it. And I'm not a small lad, and all I can say is a jumping star jump was the only thing to stop that baby squirrel running up my legs. Now, as I say, it is an important lesson, don't get too carried away. A baby squirrel may be harmless, but it could be a bull or it could be a cow. Just pay attention. They will let you know when they're not happy. Back off. Right, from, from two small native creatures to the Leviathan from foreign lands, one of the biggest animals in the world. I took this image in Alaska last year. It is a mother humpback whale and its baby. Now, it does take incredible amount of traveling and money to get such shots. And believe it or not, such a huge giant animal is deceptively hard to photograph. Um, but it is bucket list stuff. If you can go and do things like this, this is a photographer's dream. Now, this photo, I'm showing you this because it has an accidental meaning, a lucky accident. Photographers like lucky accidents. This is what makes photography great. Whales are incredibly intelligent. They look after their children like we do. They raise their children the same way of us and it takes exactly the same amount of time. The water spout from the mother whale looks just like a human mother guiding her small child. I mean, I didn't plan it, it's an accident. I've given this photo a whole new meaning just by this. It symbolizes, you know, the mother and the child and the love between the pair of them. Accidentally, the whale and the whale's calf and the phantom mother and her baby. When I put it in people's mind, it's, oh, Oh yeah, well done. How did you do that? Did you Photoshop that? No, no, not at all. It was an accident. Photographs are great for them.